An Overview of the Primarchs The Imperium of Mankind is a faction containing quadrillions upon quadrillions of people, meaning that only an infinitesimally small percentage of them are going to stand out in the history books. Sometimes these standout figures are normal humans, such as Caiaphas Cain or Sly Marbo. Others are great Astartes, such as Logan Grimnar or Dante of the Blood Angels. Likely the most well-known individuals, however, outside of the Emperor of Mankind himself, are the Primarchs, the Emperor's sons created in his image. Since their creation, the Primarchs have been everything from humanity's greatest heroes to their greatest enemies, leading great wars both for and against the Imperium. Each of the Primarchs was separated from the Emperor at birth, scattered across the galaxy, resulting in each of them developing vastly different personality traits, methods of warring, and cultural identities. This video will serve as a general overview for all of them, briefly going over the origins and histories without delving too far into the details. To begin with, let's take a brief look at the origin of the 20, or technically 21, Primarchs. Their creation goes back quite a number of millennia, to around the 29th millennium, back on Terra. The Emperor of Mankind wished to create a number of generals from his own genetic stock to lead his warriors into battle in order to reunify Terra. To recap, by the 29th millennium, humanity had already gone through a great age of technology, becoming quite advanced and spreading across the stars. This age came crashing down, however, due to a myriad of reasons, including the revolt of the Men of Iron, which were sentient machines, and the development of psychers, who grew to be largely unstable and dangerous. In the end, humanity was left fractured and scattered, with Terra surrounded by warp storms and left to starve. Almost all traces of civilization on Terra were lost, and instead various techno-barbarians battled one another over the scraps. This led the Emperor to create a race of genetically modified soldiers, the Thunder Warriors, in order to unify the planet and reclaim the rest of humanity in a Great Crusade. The Thunder Warriors, however, while powerful, were short-lived and unruly, so a replacement was needed to be created if the Emperor was to reconquer the galaxy. Thus began the Primarch Project and the creation of the Space Marine Legions. The exact specifics of how the Emperor created the Primarchs is shrouded in secrecy, as there were very few individuals involved in the process. The Primarchs were not clones of the Emperor but rather were genetically modified creations, using the gene stock of both the Emperor and another individual named Erda. The two of them were both Perpetuals, a rather unique type of human that are effectively immortal, said by Erda to be the next step in human evolution. Additionally, it's said by some that the Emperor utilized arcane lore, or powers derived from the warp, to aid in the Primarch's creation. Regardless, twenty-one of the Emperor's sons were created, grown in accelerated gene-culturing chambers. Just prior to their maturation, however, the Gods of Chaos managed to scatter them across the galaxy with a great warp vortex. Some say that the Chaos Gods tampered with them in the process as well, corrupting them in some small way. Others say that the Emperor himself engineered the scattering for some purpose, while Erda claimed that she was responsible for it in order to save the children from their fates. However it occurred, or for whatever reasons, the young Primarchs were placed across the galaxy on different planets, separated from the Emperor by great distances. Curiously, they were all placed on worlds containing distant human colonies, rather than thrown into some more horrific fate, suggesting a deliberate choice on whomever was responsible for the scattering. The Emperor, sensing that his creations were alive, resolved to find all of them throughout the course of the Great Crusade, and began using their DNA to create the Space Marine Legions. 
The genetic material of each Primarch was used to create each legion, resulting in a total of 20. And although their specific numbers are not known, estimates point to there being over 2 million space marines during the Great Crusade. We'll save an overview of the various legions for another video. Throughout the 30th millennium, all of the lost Primarchs were rediscovered, starting with Horus Lupercal, and were given command of each of their respective legions, molding them in unique ways. Let's move on then to looking briefly at each of the Primarchs in order. The first Primarch is Lion L. Johnson, also known as the Lion, or the First. He was sent to the dangerous world of Caliban, a planet tainted by the warp and covered in dense forests filled with highly aggressive wildlife. Lion lived for a decade alone in the wilderness, before eventually being found by a group of warrior knights, feral and covered in blood. The knights planned on killing him, but a man named Luther sensed something special in him, and managed to calm him down before taking him in. Luther named him L. Johnson, meaning Son of the Forest, and Lion, as his fierceness reminded him of the most ferocious of the great beasts on Caliban, the Calibanite Lion. The people of Caliban had been isolated from the rest of humanity for around 5,000 years, and lived in a feudal system of knightly orders. Lionel Johnson would end up becoming the Grand Master of the greatest of these orders, and managed to unite all of the knightly orders in a successful campaign to rid the planet of all of the great beasts. When the Emperor arrived, Lion was given command of his legion, which he named the Dark Angels, after an old Caliban myth. During the Great Crusade, Lion became known as a brilliant strategist and warrior, but was also distrusted by many of the other Primarchs due to his secretive and introverted nature. He himself has had trouble trusting his brothers, which led to a number of strained relationships. During the Horus Heresy, Lion remained loyal to the Emperor, but was too late to make it to Terra to participate in the Great Battle. Racked with guilt, he and his legion of space marines returned to Caliban, where he was betrayed by his longtime companion, Luther. After doing battle with him, Lion secretly returned to the Rock, the Dark Angel's fortress monastery ship, where he has been sleeping and waiting for a time of great need. Very recently, Lion has announced his return to aid the Imperium. For the second Primarch, there are currently no records or any information whatsoever on their identity. Every single record, statue, icon, or other information on both the second Primarch and the eleventh, as well as their respective Space Marine legions, has been wiped from the record. Obviously, the specifics of this great removal are unknown, other than the fact that it occurred at some point prior to the Horus Heresy and not even the other Primarchs speak of their lost brothers. There are rumors that many of the Space Marines that were a part of those legions ended up joining the Ultramarines, the 13th Legion, although Sanguinius, the 9th Primarch, implied at one point that at least one of the legions was purged due to genetic impurity. All in all, it's a discussion for another time, as all that really matters here is that the two lost Primarchs have no real bearing on current events. The third Primarch is Fulgrim, also known as the Phoenician and the Illuminator. Fulgrim ended up on the bleak, poor world of Chemos, a planet whose population were forced to work constantly throughout their desolate lives in order to survive. Fulgrim quickly adapted to life here, and soon began modifying the technology that the people here used to mine, increasing their efficiency dramatically. By 15, he had become a leading executive, and under his leadership, teams of engineers traveled across the planet to reclaim and repair many of the lost mining outposts. Through his efforts, Chemos's economy began to rebound, and soon he was the sole leader of the United Planet. When the Emperor eventually arrived, Fulgrim surveyed him without a word, before kneeling and offering his sword. Afterwards, Fulgrim was taken to Terra to meet his legion of space marines, 
and learned that an accident had destroyed the majority of their gene seed, meaning that there were currently only 200 of them. It's said that the speech he gave to them upon arrival inspired the Emperor so much that he named the Legion the Emperor's Children and allowed them to bear the sign of the Aquila, the Emperor's personal symbol, on their armor. Unfortunately, Fulgrim soon became obsessed with the notion that he and his Legion needed to strive for the perfection of the Emperor, perfection in all things, from military tactics to art to their appearances. During a particular campaign in the Great Crusade, Fulgrim acquired a Xenos manufactured sword and began using it personally, but unfortunately it turned out to be a demon weapon that slowly exerted the influence of chaos over him. This, combined with Fulgrim's friendship with Horus, allowed Horus to sway him to his side by convincing him that the Emperor was actually holding humanity back from true perfection. Fulgrim would go on to try and convince Ferris Manus to come to Horus' side, but failing to do so, eventually strikes him down. Later, his brother Perturabo would destroy his mortal body, but Fulgrim was reborn as a demon prince of Slanesh. After the heresy, Fulgrim would continue to serve Slanesh, and both he and the Emperor's children would be thorns in the Imperium's side for millennia to come. Next is Perturabo, Primarch of the Iron Warriors, who landed on a planet named Olympia, a rugged, mountainous world. Perturabo was brought into the houses of one of the warlords of the planet, who raised him to be a brutal and merciless general, using his intellect and skill to wipe out rival warlords. Perturabo, who possessed a natural inclination towards cold logic and technology, was disgusted by the religious Olympians, never growing to trust any of them, including his adoptive father. Unlike many other Primarchs, Perturabo was not the ruler of the planet upon the Emperor's arrival, but rather used his new Space Marine Legion to oust his adoptive father. Afterwards, he spent some amount of time on Terra, attempting to discover the many secrets of mankind's past and it's said that Perturabo had the greatest skill and affinity for scientific and technological knowledge. The other Primarchs generally kept him at a distance due to his stubbornness, ruthlessness, and for being quick to anger. Upon taking command of the Iron Warriors, he analyzed their war records and punished their failures by having one in every ten soldiers be beaten to death, a process known as decimation. During the Horus Heresy, Perturabo learned that Olympia was in rebellion in his absence, so he enacted a great purge of the planet, killing five million people along with any iron warriors that refused to take part. He even strangled his own foster sister in the process, and afterwards realized that the Emperor could never forgive him for what occurred there. Horus, on the other hand, commended him for his decisive action and so Perturabo swore an oath of loyalty to him. After the heresy, Perturabo would become a demon prince of Chaos Undivided, a faction of Chaos worshippers that venerate all of the Chaos Gods equally. The fifth Primarch is Jagatai Khan, also known as the Great Khan or the Warhawk. Khan landed on a planet named Chagoris, a lush, fertile world with wide open plains and tall mountains. The dominant empire here at the time was a well-organized aristocracy, although Khan was instead found by a small tribe in a barren grassland of the planet. The leader of this tribe saw Khan as a gift from the gods, and so when his adoptive father was slain by a rival tribe, Khan led troops to avenge his death at a young age. The reprisal was brutal, but afterwards Khan swore to end the fighting and unite all of the tribes, becoming a great leader. Eventually, Khan went on to conquer the entire planet, but as he had no wish to rule such an empire, his people dispersed back into a tribal existence. When the Emperor arrived, Khan pledged his service to him, 
and was given command of his Space Marine Legion, who became known as the White Scars. During the Great Crusade, Khan mostly kept to himself, aside from being friends with Horus and Magnus the Red, but when the heresy occurred, Khan stood on the sidelines while trying to figure out why so much bloodshed was occurring. When speaking with Mortarion, he said that while it was true that the Emperor had become a tyrant, it was also true that Horus had become a slave to chaos. Khan and the White Scars spent the next four years battling the traitors, and during the Siege of Terra, fought against Mortarion once again. In the end, he managed to decapitate Mortarion, but was grievously wounded in the process. His body was healed thanks to the Emperor, and eventually he awoke and continued to serve in the Imperium, although during a battle against the Eldar, he became lost within the Webway, their labyrinthine dimension, and hasn't been seen since. The sixth Primarch is Lehman Russ, the Great Wolf and leader of the Space Wolves. Russ ended up on a remote ice planet named Fenris, where he was adopted by a wolf pack. At one point, during a particularly harsh winter, the pack attacked a village to get at their food supplies. The villagers fought off the wolves, but thanks to Russ, all of them managed to survive and escape. The king of the people then sent raiding parties to remove the wolf menace, causing the deaths of a number of Russ's pack and the capture of Russ himself. Russ was then taken in by the king, learning to live among humans and speak, quickly becoming a master warrior, and realizing that he was more human than wolf, but superior to both. Here, he was given the name Lehman of the Russ people, and was named king after the previous one died. When the emperor arrived, he came cloaked in runes of disguise and confusion, and Russ refused to acknowledge him as master of mankind, instead challenging him to a series of tests. The first test was of eating, which the emperor failed. The second was of drinking, which the emperor also failed. The third, however, was a duel, and after hours of brawling, the emperor finally defeated Russ, and he swore fealty. He was given command of a legion, the Space Wolves, and gained a reputation during the Great Crusade as a cunning, fierce, and slightly unstable warrior. Due to his capabilities and loyalty, Russ became the Emperor's unofficial executioner, and was sent after Magnus the Red, whom the Emperor believed to be a true heretic. Rather than bringing Magnus back to Terra, Russ was manipulated by Horus into assaulting his homeworld, devastating it in the process. Later, Russ sought revenge on Horus personally, and during their duel, he managed to grievously injure Horus, although he fell into a comatose state afterwards, being notably absent from the Siege of Terra. Afterwards, he announced that he will return in the end for the final battle, before embarking into the Eye of Terror. He has been missing for thousands of years since then, with the Space Wolves occasionally heading out on a great hunt to find their missing leader. Next we have Rogel Dorn, the Primarch of the Imperial Fists. Dorn ended up on the harsh ice world of Inwit, and was adopted by the head of a clan known as the House of Dorn. Not much is known about Dorn's youth, although he soon became the ruler of the planet, and spent many years reactivating a massive fortress ship named the Phalanx that was in orbit of the planet. When the Emperor arrived, Dorn gifted the Phalanx to him, although the Emperor refused, so instead it became the fortress monastery of Dorn's legion. During the Great Crusade, Dorn developed a reputation of military genius, and it was said that he possessed perhaps the finest military mind of the Primarchs. Notably, he and his legion were masters of defense, excelling in the construction and holding of fortresses against all odds. Due to this, Dorn was tasked with designing the defenses for the Imperial Palace on Terra, a slight which greatly upset Perturabo, 
who believed himself to be the master of the technological defenses. Dorn was on his way back to Terra when the Horus Heresy broke out, and he was stranded for some time by severe warp storms. When he heard of the betrayal, he sent most of his legion to battle Horus, while he returned to Terra to deliver word of the events personally. Here, he was made Lord Commander of the Imperium, briefly, and he proceeded to bolster the defenses of the Imperial Palace even further, although he felt he was marring the perfection and beauty of the existing structure in doing so. Later, Dorne participated throughout the Siege of Terra, staying awake for months straight in the planet's defense. In the end, Dorne was stricken with grief over the failure and the Emperor's fall, and much later, Dorne went missing after attacking a Chaos fleet with a vastly outnumbered force. Only his hand was recovered, which is kept in stasis by his Space Marine chapter, and he is presumed dead. The eighth Primarch is Conrad Kurz, also known as the Night Haunter, the leader of the Night Lords. Kurz landed on the nightmarish planet of Nostromo, a world of perpetual darkness, covered in clouds of pollution. Murder, extortion, and theft were rampant, while the elite oppressed the vast underclass of foundry workers with hired thugs. Unlike most other Primarchs, Kurz was not taken in by a family, instead raising himself and surviving off of his wits and determination, feeding himself by hunting feral animals. In time, Kurz became a legendary vigilante known as the Night Haunter, gruesomely dispatching criminals across the vast city of Nostromo Quintus. Within a year, the crime rate in the city fell to near zero, causing massive changes to the society. Afterwards, Kurz appeared before the nobles that had survived this purge, and he became the first monarch of the city although he still continued to personally hunt down any criminals that appeared in his city, and he was plagued by visions of his darkest possible future. When the Emperor arrived, the citizens of the city who had adapted to the near-constant darkness couldn't bear to look upon his radiance. As the Emperor and several other Primarchs approached Kurz's palace, Kurz was hit with a vision so potent and horrifying that he tried to claw his own eyes out, stopped only by the Emperor. During the Crusade, Kurz quickly adapted to the ways of the Imperium, although he continued to be plagued with visions of the Horus Heresy. He was placed in command of a Space Marine Legion, the Night Lords, who became an efficient, humorless force who inspired fear in their enemies. His brutal tactics caused controversy among other Primarchs, and he soon became susceptible to the forces of chaos. Before long, he was no longer crusading for the Emperor and the Imperium, but rather just for the sake of death and fear. When the heresy broke out, he quickly swore allegiance to Horus, and was eventually captured by Lion L. Johnson. He was kept a prisoner for some time, before Sanguinius decided to jettison him into space frozen in a stasis coffin. He was eventually found, and was later killed by an Imperial assassin, a fate that he foresaw for many years. It's believed that Kurz allowed himself to be killed, seeing himself as a murderous and corrupt villain. Next we have Sanguinius, known as the Great Angel and Primarch of the Blood Angels. Sanguinius came to rest on a planet named Baal, a world once ravaged by viral and nuclear weapons that turned it into a toxic wasteland. The people that lived here were warring scavengers, and much of it was under the control of mutant hordes. A tribe of people known as the Blood took in Sanguinius, who had the unique trait among his brothers of sporting a pair of large angel-like wings on his back although the reasons for this are unclear. Sanguinius eventually led the blood to defeat the mutant hordes, and he became worshipped as a god by his people. The emperor arrived eventually, in disguise, 
but thanks to Sanguinius's psychic abilities, he saw through it, and first demanded the Emperor swear an oath to leave the people of Baal in peace. He also asked what would happen if he refused the Emperor's offer, the only Primarch to do so, although the Emperor knew that Sanguinius was good-hearted and would not refuse a chance to save the people of the galaxy. During the Great Crusade, Sanguinius spent three years with Horus and his legion to learn the ways of the Imperium, soon demonstrating humility, loyalty, and courage to his own legion and to his brother Primarchs. Horus valued his advice more than any other Primarch, and even said at one point that Sanguinius should have been named War Master instead of him. Despite this, Sanguinius remained loyal to the Emperor during the heresy, and was a key symbol of morale during the events, particularly during the Siege of Terra. He heroically led the defense of the Eternity Gate, and managed to defeat his brother Angron in a climactic duel, although he was heavily wounded in the process. He then joined in the assault on Horus's ship, being the first to find Horus. He attempted to sway his brother back to the side of the Emperor, but Horus refused and struck him down. It's said that during the duel, Sanguinius only managed to create a small dent in Horus's armor, but this dent allowed the Emperor to deliver the fatal blow later. Thus, Sanguinius is often regarded as the greatest of the Primarchs by the people of the Imperium, with many temples in his honor. The tenth Primarch is Ferris Manus, the Gorgon, Primarch of the Iron Hands. Manus arrived on the planet Medusa, another harsh world with constant earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. The people here live in nomadic tribes that constantly move to safer ground, and Manus did not choose to join any of these tribes at an early age. Instead, he continued to seek out physical challenges across the world in order to make himself stronger and more resilient, eventually killing a great silver worm by drowning it in magma. The melted flesh of the worm fused to his hands, giving him the iron hands that his legion would take their name from. After this, Manus went to the tribes, but rather than taking a leadership role and uniting them, he instead just lectured them on technology, allowing for their rapid advancement. When the Emperor arrived, Manus challenged him to a great duel, and after finding someone Manus considered an equal challenge, he accepted the Emperor as his leader. During the Great Crusade, Manus became friends with Fulgrim, despite their differences in aesthetics and interests. Manus and the Iron Hands were efficient and remorseless, but they believed in the Emperor's mission, and when Fulgrim came to Manus to try to sway him to Horus's side, Manus was so outraged that he attacked his brother. Fulgrim left him alive but unconscious during this duel, but later, during the battle at Istvan V, Fulgrim finished the job and dispatched Manus. Manus's head was taken to Horus, who began to speak to it later in the heresy as his mental state deteriorated. Despite his clear death, there are many among the Iron Hands that believe that Manus will return someday as an apparition of Manus appeared during the Siege of Terra to warn them that a calamity would come to befall mankind, and he would return to lead them against it. It's said that his skull is now hidden deep away on Medusa, watched over constantly by a member of the Iron Hands who does not eat, drink, sleep, or blink in his ceaseless watch. The eleventh Primarch, as mentioned, has been removed from the records, but the twelfth Primarch is Angron, also known as the Red Angel. Angron landed on the civilized world of Nuceria, which was run by cruel slave masters. Angron was found by one such slaver in the icy mountains, but curiously he was surrounded by the corpses of numerous Xenos. It's theorized that the Xenos were Eldar who had foreseen the bloodshed that Angron would cause in the future, and tried to stop him as an infant. Angron was quickly enslaved, nursed back to health, and then dumped into an arena with hundreds of other slaves. Acid then filled the arena, 
and Angron was forced to kill the other slaves in order to stand upon the top of a ziggurat in the arena to avoid the acid. He was proclaimed a promising newcomer, and was here given the name Angron, meaning Child of the Mountain. He of course became a famed gladiator, but after refusing to kill the only friend he had in the arena, he was forced to undergo a surgery as punishment. The surgery involved the implanting of a large amount of nail-like implements into the subject's brain, known as butcher's nails, with long cables running out like dreadlocks. This process made the subject far more aggressive and fierce, and afterwards Angron killed his friend in a blind frenzy. Realizing what had happened, he then led a slave revolt, marching the slaves out of the city into the wilderness. They lived there for a few years, but it became so desperate at one point that Angron fed them his own blood to keep them alive. Finally, the Emperor arrived, offering Angron a legion of space marines, limitless power, and lifetimes spent perfecting the art of conquest. To his surprise, however, Angron refused, telling his father that he would rather die amongst his comrades while fighting their oppressors. The Emperor returned to his flagship, but just as Angron and his people were marching to battle the slave masters, he teleported Angron up to his ship as his people were slaughtered down below. Angron killed one of the Emperor's custodies in a rage before the Emperor stopped him with his psychic power. He told Angron that he has his eyes set on the entire galaxy, not just a single planet, and he hoped that Angron would eventually understand why he did this. Soon Angron took control of his legion, naming them the World Eaters, although there were some bumps in the road. Angron made all members of his legion undergo the Butcher's Nails process even though it took quite a while to perfect it so that it wouldn't kill them. Angron and the World Eaters became known for their bloodlust and barbarity, and soon the Emperor sent Lehman Russ and the Space Wolves to deal with him. A brief battle ensued, in which Angron managed to best Russ in combat, but when the Emperor then sent Horus after him, Horus quickly convinced Angron to join his side in the Heresy. Angron was easy to convince, but rather than following Horus's orders to prepare for the push towards Terra, he instead mindlessly rampaged across the galaxy. By the time he eventually reached Terra, he was a blood-crazed slave to Korn, who wished to take on the Emperor himself, although Horus instead psychically guided him to fight Sanguinius. During their fight, Angron impaled his brother, but Sanguinius took the opportunity to rip out his butcher's nails, causing his head to explode and banishing him back to the warp. Since then, however, Angron has been one of the greatest enemies of the Imperium, continuing to return after any defeat he suffers. Robute Gilliman, the Avenging Son, is the 13th Primarch. Gilliman landed on the bleak world of McCraig, which was still relatively advanced compared to many other Primarchs' homeworlds, retaining a number of short-range, warp-capable craft from the Age of Technology. This allowed it to remain in contact with a handful of other neighboring star systems, and so they were aware that they were not alone in the universe. Gilliman was found and adopted by one of the two leaders of the planet, known as a Consul and he soon became a skilled administrator and a military genius. While out on a military campaign in the Wild North, the other consul attempted a coup, mortally wounding Gilliman's adoptive father in the process. Gilliman swiftly put a stop to the coup, and became the sole ruler of the planet, leading it to a new era of prosperity. During this time, the Emperor arrived on a neighboring planet, and heard great stories of Gilliman, realizing him to be one of the Lost Sons. Due to a warp storm, the Emperor wouldn't arrive on McCraig for five years, at which point it was a prosperous planet that was engaging in trade with nearby systems. 
Gilliman was given control of his legion of space marines, the Ultramarines, and quickly set out to conquer planets in the Emperor's name. Interestingly, rather than having one home planet like most other legions, the Ultramarines control over an entire subsector of systems, known as Ultramar, which allowed them to become the largest legion. Gilliman made sure that any planets he conquered were self-sufficient afterwards, when it came to defenses and economy, with a government whose first concern would always be the well-being of its people. Horus made no attempts to sway Gilliman at the onset of his heresy, instead leading the Ultramarines into a trap. Gilliman and the Ultramarines lived on, however, but due to being cut off from the rest of the Imperium by a massive warp storm, Gilliman believed that the Imperium had fallen. He created a second empire, Imperium Secundus, on McCraig as a contingency, although Sanguinius was eventually named a regent of this second empire. Eventually they learned that the Emperor still lived, and broke through the warp storm to reach Terra. Unfortunately, Gilliman was only hours away from reaching Terra when the Emperor was gravely wounded by Horus a fact that continued to haunt him for decades. Afterwards, Gilliman accepted the title of Lord Commander of the Imperium, and reorganized the Space Marine Legions into chapters, which numbered only 1,000 each, and composed the Codex Astartes, a set of rules for the chapters to follow. Sometime later, Gilliman would be grievously wounded during a battle with the Emperor's children and his body remained in stasis for thousands of years, only recently being awoken to lead the Imperium once again. The fourteenth Primarch is Mortarion, also known as the Death Lord, or the Pale King. Details on Mortarion's youth are scarce, but he landed on the feral world of Barbarus, which possessed an atmosphere thick with virulent gases, so that people could only live underneath the dense fog covering the planet. Mortarion landed in the midst of a great battle in the mountains, an area ruled by a species of Xenos who had conquered the planet ages ago and could live in the poisonous mountains. After the battle was over, the victorious warlord heard the screams of a child, and thought about killing it, but realized that no human should be even able to breathe here let alone cry out. He took in the child, naming him Mortarion, meaning Child of Death, and taught him everything he knew of warfare. Mortarion became the warlord's greatest weapon, but eventually he discovered the existence of humans living in the valleys underneath the fog, and escaped to live among them instead. He wasn't welcome immediately, due to his terrifying appearance, but he eventually proved himself an ally of his fellow humans, later uniting them and training the best among them into warriors, which he called the Death Guard. Eventually a stranger appeared in his village, one with bronzed flesh and a perfect physique, who challenged him to take on the warlord's fortress alone, which resided at the highest point on the planet. If he failed, he would join the stranger in total obedience. Mortarion tried, but the toxins were too great so high up, and he collapsed in front of the warlord. Then the stranger stepped in, killing the warlord with one blow from his sword, and so Mortarion swore allegiance to him, at which point he revealed himself to be his father, the Emperor of Mankind. During the Great Crusade, Mortarion became close friends with Horus and Conrad Kurz, although he clashed with Primarchs who he felt had easier upbringings, such as Sanguinius, Jagatai Khan, and Fulgrim. He became bitter over his perceived sidelining and underappreciation, and even proved critical of Horus's promotion to War Master, believing that only strife between his brothers would rise if the Emperor began to use Horus as his proxy during the Crusade. Surprisingly, Horus struggled to sway Mortarion to his side during the heresy, but eventually used Mortarion's hatred of all things connected to the warp, derived from his hatred of his adoptive father. 
This led him to consider the Emperor a warp-tainted abomination, as Horace argued that the Emperor had used the warp to help him create the Primarchs in the first place. After this, Mortarion fully committed to Horace's cause, eventually coming under Nurgle's service after the Plague Lord agreed to save him and his legion from a horrific disease they were inflicted with. Mortarion's Death Guard were the first to land upon Terra during the siege, getting into a duel with Jagatai Khan that resulted in him being decapitated and sent back to the warp. After the heresy, he claimed a planet and turned it into a festering hive of disease and plagues, doing such a good job that Nurgle promoted him to Demon Prince. He has continued to be a deadly enemy to the Imperium ever since. Next we have Magnus the Red, known as the Crimson King or the Red Cyclops, Primarch of the Thousand Suns. Magnus landed on the remote planet of Prospero, populated by outcast human psychers, which was fortunate for Magnus as he was the most psychically gifted of his brothers. Magnus landed in the central plaza of their capital city and was taken in by a famed scholar soon becoming the greatest psyker on the planet and its leader, rebuilding many of its cities. Unlike the other Primarchs, Magnus was able to use the warp to telepathically connect to the Emperor, and so when the Emperor eventually arrived on Prospero, the two of them had already been conversing for years. The legion that Magnus inherited, the Thousand Sons, were also psychers in some fashion, due to being created with Magnus's genes, leading him to train them properly. Unfortunately, their connection to the warp also caused them to be rife with mutations, and so he tried to bargain with an entity, later discovered to be Zinch, to save them from the mutations. The bargain failed, and Magnus lost his right eye, but the mutations did go into remission for some time. Magnus's affinity for the warp and cavalier attitude worried the Emperor, however, as well as his brothers, notably Lehman Russ and Mortarion. To solve the dispute over usage of the warp, the Emperor called for a debate, which resulted in only astropaths and navigators being tolerated in the Imperium, a decision that displeased Magnus. To this end, he returned to Prospero to secretly continue his warp experiments, soon experiencing a vision of Horus's revolt, although he couldn't see his own role in this heresy. He attempted to telepathically sway Horus from this path, but failed, so instead he tried to warn the Emperor via an astral projection spell. While projecting, he came across a webway corridor that led to Terra, and decided to use it as a shortcut, not knowing that this corridor was built by the Emperor as part of a highly secretive project to unite the Imperium. Failing to breach the corridor, an anonymous voice from within the warp offered him the extra power he needed, and Magnus accepted without question, using it to tear a hole in the corridor and follow it to Terra. This breach allowed demons to invade the webway, irreparably ruining the Emperor's project. He was so enraged that he didn't even listen to Magnus's warning, banishing him from his presence and ordering Lehman Russ to arrest Magnus and bring him to Terra in person. Horus convinced Russ to exterminate the Thousand Sons in the process, and what followed became known as the Burning of Prospero resulting in the death of Magnus's physical form and his disappearance into the warp. Magnus's consciousness was broken up into shards, which were eventually gathered to prevent his deterioration into nothingness. He soon joined Horus's side, taking part in the Siege of Terra as vengeance against the Emperor for betraying him. During the siege, Magnus became a demon prince of Zinch, and did battle with his brother Vulcan inside of the webway, while also trying to psychically weaken the Emperor. Magnus managed to disintegrate Vulcan at the genetic level as Vulcan smashed his head in, banishing him back to the warp. 
Magnus would go on to become a great enemy to the Imperium, currently trying to elevate humanity to a truly psychic race from his stronghold on Prospero. The most infamous of the Primarchs, the 16th, is Horus Lupercal, Primarch of the Luna Wolves. Horus landed on the world of Chthonia, close to the Soul System, thus being the first Primarch found during the Crusade. Chthonia had been colonized, tunneled, and mined out for thousands of years, now being largely abandoned, riddled with catacombs and crumbling ruins. Filled with vicious gangs and struggling people, Horus was discovered by a gang overlord, and soon became caught up in the gang warfare that encapsulated life there, being named Nergui, meaning no name. This changed when he discovered the pod he had arrived in, in the process of being excavated by the Adeptus Mechanicus, killing one of them and escaping with its weapon. Soon after, the Mechanicum launched an attack on the gang's hold, and Horus's adoptive father instructed him to kill him in order to earn his kill name. Upon doing so, Horus suddenly gained buried memories of the galaxy, technology, and himself, and his body began to swell into that of a Primarch, proclaiming himself to now be Horus. After this, he was brought to Terra to kneel before the Emperor, where he swore fealty. Since he was the only Primarch to be raised in part by the Emperor, he became the most powerful among them, and so he was chosen to be the War Master of the Emperor's Great Crusade, granted command over all Imperial forces. This decision strained his relationship with several other Primarchs, and in time strained his relationship with his father, as he felt that the Emperor was abandoning them for reasons he wouldn't say. During the Crusade, on the world of Davin, Horus would be wounded by a blade of Nurgle, and during the healing process, which was overseen by a member of the Word Bearers, Erebus, Horus was corrupted by chaos. Horus was shown visions of the future, in which the Emperor ruled as a god, and the Primarchs were all discarded, outliving their usefulness to him. He was also told that the Emperor had used the powers of the Warp to create the Primarchs, which led to them being scattered across the galaxy. Since the Emperor had banned any research into the Warp, Horus saw this as pure hypocrisy, and so the heresy began. The Horus heresy of course deserves its own series of videos, so I won't go over everything Horus did here but it ended with Horus doing battle with the Emperor in one-on-one -on -one combat. The Emperor held back his full power during the fight, not wishing to believe that his favored son could have fallen so far, until a single individual, sometimes said to be a custodian, other times said to be a simple imperial guard named Olanius Pius, entered the room. Horus flayed the man alive with a look, and realizing that Horus couldn't be saved, the Emperor struck him down, obliterating his soul in the process, although he had suffered grievous wounds in the duel. Afterwards, Horus became nothing more than a bitter memory for the Imperium, likely the most hated individual to ever live, and a constant reminder of what can happen if they don't remain vigilant in their faith. In a similar fashion, the 17th Primarch is Lorgar Aurelian, the Primarch of the Word Bearers. Lorgar landed on the planet of Colchis, a massive desert planet with a 170 hour day night cycle. A nomadic tribe took in Lorgar, a name meaning rain caller, and he was soon discovered by an exiled priest that immediately sensed the greatness within him. He took Lorgar in as his disciple, frequently abusing him in the process, and Lorgar developed a strong connection to the major church on the planet, the Covenant. The Covenant was a polytheistic faith, but Lorgar came to believe that there must be a single deity above them all, a notion that led his mentor to abuse him further to dissuade him from believing it. Despite the abuse, Lorgar quickly surpassed his master as a charismatic preacher, 
winning many followers and becoming an archpriest. After saving his mentor's life, the priest named him the new Bearer of the Word, and his fame quickly spread. Lorgar soon began to have visions of a mighty warrior in gleaming bronze armor coming to Colchis, and so he began to preach that the prophesied return of Colchis's god was soon to occur, causing Lorgar's enemies in the Covenant to brand him a heretic. Thus began a holy war of immense proportions across the planet that lasted for several years, which Lorgar ultimately won, after which the Emperor and Magnus the Red arrived on Colchis. Lorgar immediately recognized both of them from his visions, swearing fealty to the Emperor and reorganizing the belief structure of the Covenant to be focused on the Emperor as their savior. The Emperor didn't approve of all of this, as he was trying to spread the Imperial Truth, which was an ideology defined by reason and secular progress discarding older traditions of religion and superstition. This was made even worse during the Great Crusade, as Lorgar and his legion, the Word Bearers, spread the word of the divinity of the Emperor, and Lorgar himself penned a tome titled the Lectitio Divinitatis, detailing the Emperor as a deity that needed to be worshipped. This book would later become instrumental in the founding of the Imperial Cult. The Emperor personally reprimanded Lorgar, forcing him and his entire legion to kneel before him, and ordered the Ultramarines to destroy his project on the planet Monarchia, in order to demonstrate that worship of the Emperor was not to be tolerated. Ultimately, the Emperor accomplished little in stopping his worship, and instead this humiliation and reproach served only to turn Lorgar to chaos. Lorgar's top lieutenants, his mentor from Colchis and an individual named Erebus, whispered to him that great chaos gods welcomed and even demanded zealous worship, slowly poisoning his mind against the Emperor. Before long, Lorgar was fully converted to the side of chaos, venerating the chaos gods, and he was the one that sent Erebus to Davin to oversee Horus's corruption. The ensuing war is named after Horus, but it's hard to say how much of it would have occurred without Lorgar's full involvement. Lorgar would go on to be a major player in the heresy, eventually beginning to believe that Horus was too weak to lead the fight against the Emperor, and became committed to killing Horus and taking his place. This coup, of course, failed, and instead Horus beat him mercilessly before banishing him from his sight. After the heresy, Lorgar became a demon prince, and proceeded to isolate himself for thousands of years in meditation. Recently, however, it's rumored that Lorgar has finally returned to lead the word-bearers against the Imperium once more. Vulcan is the 18th Primarch leader of the Salamander's Legion. Vulcan arrived on the planet Nocturne, a world under massive tectonic stress due to an oversized moon, and the enormous levels of stellar radiation here have given most forms of life a dark, obsidian-like appearance, including its people. Vulcan was taken in by a blacksmith, and before long, Vulcan was teaching previously unknown forging techniques to the people of Nocturne. During his fourth year here, the planet was raided by Dark Eldar, which was a somewhat common occurrence. Rather than hiding like the others, Vulcan stood in the center of town in defiance, inspiring others to join him in defeating the raiders. In celebration, a tournament was held although a stranger arrived in the middle of the festivities and asked to compete. Vulcan and the stranger wagered that whoever lost would forever serve the victor, but after the end of eight days of trials, the two were tied. In the final event, both were given 24 hours to construct a weapon and use it to hunt down the largest salamander they could find. Vulcan managed to kill a very large one, but was caught in a volcanic eruption and ended up clinging to the side of a cliff, 
still holding on to his kill. He was forced to decide between keeping his kill or saving his life, until the stranger appeared, carrying his own drake, one bigger than Vulcan's. The stranger tossed his aside immediately into the lava to help save Vulcan, and afterwards Vulcan kneeled before the man, saying that anyone who would value life over pride was worthy of his service. Of course, the stranger was revealed to be the Emperor, and Vulcan spent several years under his tutelage before taking command of his legion. During the Great Crusade, Vulcan proved himself to be an honorable general, becoming enraged after seeing how Conrad Kurz and his night lords waged war. When the Horus Heresy began in force with the drop site massacre of Istvan V, Vulcan was caught in the midst of the trap, surrounded by traitor legions. He was soon captured by Conrad Kurz, who spent months torturing him to break his spirit and kill him. Unlike other Primarchs, the trait that Vulcan inherited from the Emperor was his nature as a perpetual, meaning that Vulcan was capable of regenerating from any injury, up to and including full disintegration. Kurz was infuriated by being unable to kill him, and eventually Vulcan managed to escape, ending up on the planet McCraig in the care of the Ultramarines. After being seemingly killed by a petrified bolt of the Emperor's psychic abilities by an assassin, Vulcan regenerated back on Nocturne and made his way to Terra. His survival was largely kept secret during the siege, but he battled Magnus the Red, which ended with Magnus being banished back to the warp and Vulcan being disintegrated on a genetic level, although this still was not enough to kill him. After the heresy, Vulcan announced to his legion that he would return at a later date, during the end times, disappearing for 1500 years. When he returned, he single-handedly defended the world of Caldera from a massive orc invasion, but announced that this was only temporary in order to stop the orc war boss known as the Beast. He ended up doing so, using the massive psychic energy generated by the horde of orcs, but was seemingly obliterated in the process. For now, he's presumed dead, although the salamanders still search for him, believing that Vulcan will return after they find all nine of the artifacts that he forged. The 19th Primarch is Corvus Korax, head of the Raven Guard Legion. Korax ended up on the moon called Lycaeus, which orbited the planet Kiavar. Kiavar was a technologically advanced forge world that greatly benefited from the legions of slaves that mined the moon for minerals. Korax was discovered by a slave girl named Nasturi, and the slaves here kept the Primarch a secret, giving him his name, which means the Deliverer. The slaves quickly came to believe that Korax was the savior they had waited for, and before long he began leading them in a rebellion against their masters. It was soon evident that Korax excelled in guerrilla tactics, outmaneuvering and ambushing the greater forces from Kiavar, crushing their supply lines, and causing the planet to collapse into civil war. With the slaves freed and the planet revolutionized, the inhabitants of Lycaeus renamed it to Deliverance, and it's said that the Emperor arrived on Deliverance that day. Soon after, Korax was given command of the Raven Guard, and the Adeptus Mechanicus stepped in to rebuild and run the planet Kiavar. During the Great Crusade, Korax continued to demonstrate his affinity for covert ops and hit-and-run tactics, winning many battles along the way. Unfortunately, he never saw eye to eye with Horus, and he also began to display great mistrust towards any warriors in his legion who were born on Terra rather than Deliverance, due to the way they waged war. Korax instead sought to transform his legion into a force for liberation of the oppressed, and despite Korax being often compared to Conrad Kurz, Korax retained a degree of humanity. During the drop site massacre at the start of the heresy, he and the Raven Guard were hit hard by the ambush, and the legion was left in a lowly state. Thanks to the Emperor's guidance, however, 
Korax was led to a complex containing the common genome that all Primarchs shared, allowing him to create new space marines. Unfortunately, members of the Alpha Legion managed to corrupt this genome, resulting in the creation of hundreds of tainted Astartes with severe mutations. Korax and the Raven Guard had little impact on the remainder of the heresy, not participating in the Siege of Terra, and afterwards he proceeded to kill off the remainder of his legion who were tainted. Racked with guilt over what he had done, he locked himself in his fortress for a year, begging for the Emperor's mercy. After emerging, he proceeded into the Eye of Terror on an endless hunt for the traitor Primarchs, seeking revenge for the drop site massacre. This is the last that anyone in the Imperium has seen of Korax, but the Raven Guard has continued on, still continuing in their Primarch specialization of guerrilla warfare. Finally, we have perhaps the most curious of the Primarchs, Alpharius Omegon, also known as the last Primarch. Alpharius is unique for two reasons one being the great degree of secrecy revolving around every aspect of their existence as well as their legion, the Alpha Legion. Second is that Alpharius Omegon is actually two Primarchs, twins known as Alpharius and Omegon. It's unknown even to them on whether this was a deliberate decision on the Emperor's part or if they were somehow split into two by the warp during the scattering although they are often described as one soul in two bodies. Due to the great degree of secrecy surrounding these two, there are actually quite a number of different accounts of their origins. Most accounts describe them as being the last Primarch to be found, towards the tail end of the Great Crusade. One account states that Alpharius was the leader of a confederation of systems, who incidentally ambushed Horus and his Luna Wolves leading to Horus discovering him as the last of his lost brothers. Another story states that Alpharius was found on a distant dead world, where he was forced to survive for many years utterly alone until some half-human renegades and alien mercenaries arrived to plunder the ruins, which allowed him to take their weapons and ship. Other accounts state that he landed on a thriving tech world known as Bar Savor, where nightmarish Xenos worm creatures descended to feed. These creatures captured Alpharius and kept him as a curiosity, twisting his mind and turning him into a living weapon until the Emperor himself liberated him. All of these accounts mention only Alpharius, as it was a little known secret that Omegon even existed. The two often swapped places, with Alpharius being the public face of the Primarch, although the two are not entirely alike in personality and they don't always see eye to eye. Regardless, Alpharius was given control of the Alpha Legion of Space Marines, who became experts in infiltration, covert operations, and manipulation. When the heresy broke out, Alpharius sided with Horus, although the reasons for this aren't entirely clear. It's said that around two years before the start of the heresy, Alpharius was contacted by members of a Xenos organization called the Cabal, who gave him visions of the impending civil war within the Imperium. It's believed that the Cabal convinced Alpharius that the only way to permanently defeat Chaos was to ensure that Horus was victorious during the war, and that Alpharius only joined Horus because he wanted to ultimately defeat the Chaos Gods. Whatever the case, Alpharius and the Alpha Legion played a key role in the Drop Site Massacre, as well as infiltrating the Raven Guard in order to corrupt the Primarch genome and prevent Korax from rebuilding his legion. At the Battle of Pluto, Alpharius battled Rogel Dorn, and despite being the quicker of the two and wounding Dorn many times, Dorn ultimately outmaneuvered his brother and slew him. After the heresy, Omegon took Alpharius's place, continuing to battle the Imperium, including winning a notable victory over the Ultramarines. Over the years, the great amount of secrecy related to Alpharius Omegon has led to quite a bit of confusion over which of the two died at Dorne's hand, if any. 
and so far a dozen champions have been slain that bore the name of Alpharius. At least one of the two is almost certainly still around, but due to both of their capabilities in disguise and deception, it's unlikely that they'll ever both appear again. With that, we've covered all 21 of the Primarchs. Between them, nine of them remained loyal to the Imperium, ten turned traitor, and two are completely unknown. In many ways, they represent some of the sillier aspects of Warhammer 40k from a time when it wasn't meant to be taken so seriously, such as having the Primarch with literal iron hands be called a name that means iron hands leading a space marine legion called the Iron Hands. Most of the history surrounding the Primarchs dates back quite a ways, as only a handful of them are still relevant to the Imperium in the present day, but more and more of them are showing up again as times become more desperate. Since they are the most capable individuals within the entire Imperium outside of the Emperor, it makes sense that much of the Imperium's history is dictated by their actions. Time will tell as to which Primarchs will ultimately make a return and which will stay dead, and on whether or not we ever get info on the two lost Primarchs. For now though, most of their history is written in blood. <laughs>